the faults in our metrics, rethinking how we measure detection and response. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I've worked in detection and response for the last decade, and I've made a lot of mistakes, uh, especially when it comes to metrics. Uh, this is the talk I wish I had seen. Today you'll get three things, a framework I built to help you build much better metrics, a new maturity model that I've been using to describe and measure detection and response capabilities, and lots of examples. And my story with metrics starts on a Monday morning. I'm only a few months into a new job, and I get a message from my boss. He's like, the board of directors meeting is coming up, and he's looking for updated program metrics. You can tell I'm new to senior management. I don't ask any questions. I'm really eager to please. And so I send a message to my new team, and I ask them, hey, what metrics have we presented in the past? And what's the response? Bad news. Last manager just made those up. And good news, I'm going to do so much better. Uh, how many of you have had this happen, where you inherit someone else's metrics mess? Yeah, uh, it's often our starting place. Metrics that haven't been well thought out, and maybe even worse, fudged to avoid questions or more work. So I did what you probably did. I Googled it. And then I just ended up copying the metrics I used at my last job. And that's led me to using a lot of bad metrics. But so what? Why should I care about metrics? Well, you came to a talk about metrics. Why do you care about metrics? Right, measuring how well you're doing. Are you getting there? We're restructuring our team and we need better ways to measure how the team is performing. That's right, uh, team restructure. Let's see if this is actually better or not. What else? <laughs> I like that, yes. Um, metrics are supposed to help us drive improvement, right? Uh, Carl Pearson, he's a late 1800s, 1900s guy. He's widely viewed as the founder of modern statistics. And he's got a quote he's famous for. Uh, it'll be in your Google search if you're ready to talk about metrics. Uh, that which is measured improves which at first sounds like a great plug for why metrics are important. But there's an implied warning in that message. What if you're measuring the wrong thing? There's a paper written by these two guys out of MIT, Hauser and Katz, and the paper's called Metrics, You Are What You Measure. And they talk about the more you pay attention to metrics, you start to make decisions to improve those metrics. The metrics you choose will improve. And over time, you'll become what you measure. Metrics also help us communicate what we do and why people should care. Um, Edward Tufte, who teaches uh, this really great course on presenting data, it's nothing to do with security. Um, it's a really fun course, talks about the ways that we have failed at presenting data. He's got a whole section about terrible PowerPoints, which is really fun. Um, and he's got a quote that says, metrics reveal data. Metrics are a tool that enable us to present the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. And why? Well, let's be honest. We need a budget. We need headcount. And metrics are usually the tool we use to communicate that. So why are security metrics hard? Why are security metrics so hard? I feel like a lot of the times you don't know how to tell the story of what's going on. Yeah. You lost the numbers. Yeah. You're trying to tell a story of what's going on, but you just have a bunch of, of numbers. Yeah. Random data is random. Random data is random. Yes. It's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove a negative. I've heard that one before, right? Like in security, we do all this work and uh, it's hard to show if it did anything, if the bad thing really didn't happen right away. Yeah. Bad metrics are arguably less. Yeah, bad metrics are arguably less, yeah. Um, for me, 
uh, in my own personal experience, security metrics are hard because I'm a security person and I don't care that much about metrics. <laughs> Here's a much less famous quote. Metrics are an annoying PowerPoint I need to update every month. That's me. A bit about me, I'm a senior staff engineer at Airbnb. I work on fun things like enterprise security, threat detection, and incident response. And I love my job. Uh, I live up in Austin with my wife and three-year-old son, Liam. And I love being a dad and a husband. And there's one thing I'm really good at as a husband, as a dad, and as a security engineer. I'm really good at making mistakes. And this is the point of the talk where I'm supposed to gain some credibility with all of you. Tell you about my accolades, my years of experience, but really, I've just been making mistakes. Let me tell you about five of them. And the first terrible mistake I've made with metrics is losing sight of the goal. How many of you uh, work the alert queue or are on call in, in some way or fashion? Yes, the tired people in the room. Um, I'm on call right now, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to act them right here. Um, uh, this marks my 10 year anniversary of being on call. And for those of us that spend our days triaging alerts and responding to fires, it's really easy to lose sight of the goal. And so we end up describing that frontline operational work with metrics like this one. Yeah. You've seen this metric before. You probably have this metric or have had this metric in the past. And here's a metric that shows the number of security alerts per month. And if you take a closer look, you can see that in the past year, March and April had the most alerts. My boss will ask a question about that. And if you keep looking at it, it generally looks like alerts are trending down. Uh, did we do that? Uh, did we stop logging something in February? Did I just get mad at the IPS and be like, you know what, these rules suck. These are all just getting turned off. Uh, alert count has become the heartbeat metric for security operations. Instead of rooting back to the goal of detecting threats and responding quickly, we've reduced ourselves to cries for help. Uh, I've come to call this metric the operational burden we've inflicted on ourselves. Uh, another title might be, uh, we're doing things, it's crazy out there. Uh, maybe it's fear-driven, scare leadership with a bunch of alerts. And sometimes we try to make it a bit better. We break it down by true and false positives. I've been proud of myself for doing this. But if I'm honest, I'm sure, I'm not sure what I was trying to say with this metric. That we have a lot of false positives. So what's a good true to false positive ratio? Is it the same for every type of alert? Exactly. Would reducing false positives mean I'm potentially decreasing my visibility in the threats? Is having too many false positives causing me to miss true positives? And so the first problem I'm running into is I don't know where to start with metrics. Detection and response has come a long way, uh, but I'm still stuck here making metrics about alert volume. So I need a starting place. And so to give you a starting point, I thought about what in detection and response could we measure to help us make decisions and see if we're improving. And you can remember these by the acronym SAVER. We want to show that we're streamlining our operations, improving our efficiency and accuracy, either through automation, better tooling, processes. We want to raise awareness about what we're learning from threat intel, sharing things like threats and trends we should be prepared for. We want to measure our vigilance. How prepared are we for those top threats? Can we detect them? And as we learn about new threats and trends, how is that guiding our threat hunts? As we explore our networks, what are we finding? And then when our detections fire or our threat hunts turn into incidents, what's our readiness? How quickly are we able to organize and respond to incidents? And how complete are, are the playbooks? So when you're thinking about your own metrics, think about 
which category the metric should fall under. And this can help you tie it back to an outcome. And I, when I'm building out metrics, I like to start with just one per category. Uh, we often get asked to make a lot of metrics, um, and that doesn't really help us focus. And generally speaking, that's one of the biggest challenges in an operational role is we, we're constantly going from one thing to the next. And for each metric, we should ask, what question does this metric answer? So what question were we trying to answer with this metric? I think it was something around time. Are false positives taking up too much of our time? Do I have enough time to investigate true positives? And then another question you can ask is, how do we control this metric? How do we reduce our false positives? So how do we do that? Yeah, how's that going? <laughs> exactly. And if I map this to our saver categories, it's a streamlined metric, right? It's supposed to answer questions about how efficient, accurate, how much we're using our automation. And I have two big problems with this metric. The first is that this metric actually doesn't tell us where we're spending most of our time. It seems like it does. And second, the only control I have for this metric is tuning or turning alerts off, which is, you know, not always the greatest motivation. So let's make it better. And here's a graph of time spent on false positives. And I've completely removed the true positives for now because for now, I'm okay that we spend as much time as needed on the true positives. But instead of tracking how many false positives there are, I'm tracking how much time is being spent on them. So now, how much time you spend working on an alert manually, you could measure that simply by the time that the alert got assigned to when it was marked as a false positive. Now, if your team's anything like mine, we have this incredibly bad habit where when we're working the alert queue, we got all the alerts there, what do we do? Select them all, assign them to ourselves. And why do we do that? What metric makes us do that? How many you triage? Your time to triage? Um, your SLAs? How quickly did an alert get assigned to somebody? Uh, this is a good reminder that uh, you know we're all smart, lazy people, right? That's what we got in this field. Um, and so if there's a way to hack a metric, we absolutely will. So if we're obsessed with mean time to assigned and getting that metric down, you absolutely will get it down, but you might not be getting a lot of value from that. So my recommendation is at least temporarily stop measuring it. And then this metric suddenly becomes a lot more accurate. And then how do we control this metric? How do I reduce the amount of time I have to spend on an alert? Better processes. Better processes. Automation, maybe. Training. Training. Turn the alerts off. Turn the alerts off. <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, if you have an alert that you're like, all right, if I look at the time here, uh, we're spending all the time on this one alert, and we don't have time for anything else, maybe we do evaluate. Like, how valuable is this one? But as we get more automation tools, the number of events or the specific amount of time that is spent might not matter. Because if I have an alert and maybe it fires all the time, but I've automated it, I don't ever have to look at it. My opinion, let it go all day. I don't care. I don't have to do anything for it. If I can automate it so that it's always marked as a false positive, when it needs to be a false positive, fantastic. And as you automate, you can carry the time that you spent manually over to automated. And this lets you speak to something really cool. You can speak to the amount of human hours your automation efforts are saving you. So now we're not just incentivized to tune our alerts, turn them off. We're actually incentivized to find out where's the most manual time being spent and how do we automate it.
which is usually not something we're that motivated to do. Second mistake. Second mistake is using quantities that lack controls, or more simply said, measuring the things you can't change. Uh, mean time to recover is a classic incident response metric, also will be in your Google search. And in this example, you'll see that recovery was lower in September and October, and then it grew in November and December. But then the team pulled together, we worked really hard, and we got those recovery times back down. Or maybe this is Thanksgiving, this is the Christmas holidays, this is New Year's. Uh, it's funny, I spent the last year researching metrics for detection and response, and I have learned that we're obsessed with speed metrics. The vast majority of results I ha uh, that when you look them up are about mean time. Mean time to detect, mean time to respond, mean time to contain, to recover. I'm certainly not going to argue that speed isn't important. But when we use time as the sole measurement across incident phases, we completely ignore quality and effectiveness. But my big problem with this metric is that security incidents have a lot of variability, especially the further downstream you get in the response process. Not all incident is the same, by far. A lot of dependencies occur from event start to recovery, and not all of that can be controlled, at least not by your teams. And so a graph like this, it doesn't help me make any decisions, because it doesn't reveal what's controllable. How do I get better here? I don't know where to go. And what happens when you have a metric that you can't affect? You stop caring about it. Okay, great, it went up and then it went down. Sounds good. So instead, I've tried breaking out the response time across the different phases. And here, I've done some filtering of any built-in time I know I need for either quality, for the playbook itself. I know this playbook, like if I need to go isolate a machine, it's gonna go and take this much time. I know for uh, certain types of scale of incident, I know for this many hosts, that's the multiplier. And I like to do this because every response playbook has some type of built-in time you'll need. And sure, as you mature your capabilities, that built-in time will come down, but that's not the focus for this graph. Here we're looking at what can we control today? Uh, Eric Brandwine, uh, he gives us really great talk. He's from AWS. The talk is called The Tension Between Absolutes and Ambiguity in Security. Uh, it's on YouTube, Eric Brandwine, Tension Between Absolutes and Ambiguity in Security. And in it, he says, when you look at a metric, it should immediately answer, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? And one of the easiest ways to do that is to make the answer zero if there's nothing to do. Here I've filtered out all the time I can't reduce right now. And if there's nothing to do, I've made the answer zero. The other nice thing with this is you can actually present a large amount of metrics on a single dashboard when you filter out and make it zero because your eye will immediately just, okay, great, nothing to do, nothing to do. Oh something to do. So now when I look at this metric, I go, okay, we're struggling somewhere in the remediate phase for these incidents. What do I need to filter out here? And what can I actually improve today? And then you can make your metrics actionable. All right, mistake number three, thinking proxy metrics are bad or more simply, choosing amazing metrics that are insanely expensive to create when all you really needed was a correlating metric that was good enough. <laughs> Here's a great example. Uh, so a long time ago, my team and I decided that we wanted to know what our MITRE attack coverage was. And this was before, this was like the really cool, cool thing to do. Uh, and we determined to do this, we were going to have to write tests across the entire framework. And then once we got going, we figured out that, well, one test per technique probably won't tell us much. 
And then we've also got Windows, a Mac, and Linux, so we're going to need tests for all of those. And so after years of developing tests, investing in tooling, we finally had the data we needed to visualize our attack detection coverage. Uh, side note, I saw a really great tweet the other day. It said, we need to do a better job of mocking vendors that claim 100% MITRE attack coverage. Uh, for many reasons, obviously. But most importantly, uh, I've seen the carnage of 100% coverage and it's alert fatigue like you wouldn't believe. Anyway, we spent years gathering all this data and it's really cool. But at the end of the day, all we really wanted to know was where do we prioritize our detection building? So do this instead. Rather than trying to measure your detection coverage across the entire attack matrix, start by finding the top five threats you care about the most. And don't overthink it. Look at your external threat intel, think about what industry you're working in, what type of environment you have, and then look internally at your incident trends. What types of incidents are reoccurring? And then link those back to your organization's security risks. What would be a really bad day for your company? If data was exfiltrated, what data would make your chief privacy officer cry the most? It's a great metric, by the way. You can do like sizes of tears. It's really eye-catching. And then once you've got your top five, prioritize your detection development from there. And I like to workshop these as a team. We all kind of split up the top five threats and then we'll use attack to derive all the different techniques and sub-techniques. And as you write your tests and detections, you'll slowly end up building yourself a prioritized MITRE attack coverage map, but without all the alert fatigue and a super upfront costly metric. And plus the metric of how close you are of best friends to your chief privacy officer has moved as well. All right, mistake number four, not adjusting to the altitude. Uh, and as someone who has floated back and forth between management and individual contributor, I'm very guilty of this one. Um, who here has ever tried to explain all the different phases of the MITRE ATT&CK framework to a board of directors? Yeah, I have. Sure, why not? Uh, I think detection coverage is actually one of our better new metrics. But wow, we have done a bad job at explaining it at the leadership level. Uh, I've seen one of those MITRE ATT&CK heat maps generated from a specific vendor just slapped into a board of directors deck as if it mean, means anything to them. So we need metrics at every altitude. And the higher the altitude, the less it will be about the detection and response technology itself and a much more about how it impacts the business. It's helpful for me to think about it like a pyramid. Um, for the business, the impact we make is reducing the cost of an incident or breach. Or another way to think about it might be making it more costly for an attacker to cause impact. And so our metrics at the top of our pyramid, our North Star metrics, are about how quickly we can alert the organization to a threat and how quickly we can get things to business back as usual. But then under that top layer, we can talk about coverage and effectiveness. Can we detect those top threats to the business? Do we have playbooks for the attacks most likely to happen? Do we have the visibility we need? And then under that layer, how well do your tools perform? How much time do you spend trying to figure out what logs you need to search and then how long it takes you to search them. And organizing your metrics in a pyramid can help you connect those lower level layers to your North Star metrics and speak at an altitude that's appropriate for your audience. Uh, organizing them in a pyramid can also help you connect your metrics with the rest of the security organization. Uh, it turns out Detection and response is not always the best strategy. If your metrics show that mean time to respond is trending up because of a reoccurring type of incident, sometimes the best way to reduce that cost isn't by improving your streamlined or your readiness metrics. It's getting your prevention teams 
to put a new control in place to prevent that incident from occurring. And when you have metrics that you can essentially tell that story of, hey, this is going up and this is how much it costs for us to bring that down, maybe we should think about prioritizing this from a prevention standpoint and plugging that into the rest of the organization. Mistake number five is asking why instead of how. And my natural inclination is to ask why. Why didn't we detect the malware sooner? Why are we still missing firewall logs? And as a dad, I have a lot of why questions. <laughs> why did we bring the car seat when we only took one taxi ride the whole trip? Why do we need four suitcases? Why didn't we bring the stroller? Why can't Liam walk by himself? Such a little boss here. Uh, and in all of these examples, why is not helping? So instead I've learned to move straight to the how and start figuring out what actually needs to be done. Because often answering how allows you to identify the underlying problem much faster and from a much more positive perspective, especially from your spouse, I mean coworker. How can I carry Liam a car seat and at least two suitcases through the airport? How can I detect these types of threats sooner? How can we respond faster? When I interview with my current VP, she asked me, how do you build a modern detection and response program? How do we get there? It was like one question interview. How do we describe where we are today and where we're going? And it made me think about maturity models. And my first exposure to maturity models was the hunting maturity model. This Anyone not familiar with the hunting maturity model? Yeah, so the hunting maturity model, uh, you know, it's been around since I think like 2015, 2014, but essentially it was a way to describe different levels of maturity for doing threat hunting. Speaking to you're at a level where you have basic IOCs and you're searching for them to I'm using advanced data analysis to find things that are unknown in my networks. And it was really helpful because when I, could, when I would speak to an organization, I could, we, could, we could have a conversation about what their maturity of threat hunting was. And it gave me an idea of like, okay, where are we today with threat hunting? It gave us as security practitioner, uh, practitioners this common language to answer, where are we now? What tools and processes do we have? What's the current situation? What are the challenges? And where are we going? Where do we wanna be by next year? And how are we getting there? How are we going to achieve them? So as an extension to the threat hunting, to the hunting maturity model, I created the threat detection and response maturity model. And the TDR maturity model builds off of the hunting maturity model and expands it across all the different areas of detection and response. And there's a lot to it. So at the end, there's a link to the full maturity model that you can use and the first pillar I thought about when measuring maturity was observability or having the tools and logs that give us visibility into our entities and user activity and enriching it so we can contextualize the data and search it quickly. And then proactive threat detection where we focus on collecting threat intel so we can prioritize the detections that we build and buy and the hunts we perform. And then rapid response, where we prepare with playbooks and automations so we can move from triage to analysis and respond with all the capabilities we need. And we can use these pillars and these 14 capabilities to describe and measure where we are today and where we want to go next. And for each of the 14 capabilities in the framework, you'll score four different areas, process, tools, documentation, and testing. And you'll rate those from initial all the way up to leading. And in the slide deck, I've provided just general guidance, but the framework itself has a lot more specific direction for each capability. So for example, if we were to rate our detection engine capability, we can think about the processes we have. Do we have a process for creating a detection that looks for first time occurrences? Do we have a process that defines the most optimal way to determine thresholds? And then we rate our tools. 
are the detections we have managed from a central location? And then documentation, or what's been the case for most of my career, the lack thereof. And then finally, testing. How do you validate that our logic to determine first time occurrences is actually working? And as you go through each of the capabilities, I like to rate them individually and then get together as a team and rate them as a team exercise. Because once you get everyone talking about the different capabilities, you'll hear things that'll change your mind or confirm your own rating. And then once you've rated all of your capabilities, you can visualize it. And here's an example of how you can take those ratings and show at a high level where you are today across the three pillars and where you plan to be by some endpoint, say end of year, based on the projects you're planning and your initiatives. And I really like using this tool because at a leadership level, it's a very simple message, but you have a lot of underlying detail that you can go into. But I also really like it because it shows whether the work you're doing has an impact on your maturity. So if you've planned a bunch of projects and work for the year, and you do this exercise and the bars don't move, maybe you're not doing the right projects. And this is a great way to show that. And then as you do that work, you'll need metrics to show that you're getting better. And so this is where Saber comes back in again. And for each metric you create, you'll put it into this structure here. You want to avoid my mistake number one, losing sight of the goal, and ask what question does this metric answer? What outcome are we looking to achieve? And then use those categories to help tie it back to your outcome and North Stars. And you want to avoid my mistake number two, having metrics that you can't control. Don't forget to make it zero as well. Filter out what you can't control today so that when you look at a metric, you know exactly what it's telling you to do. And then if you have control of a metric, what risks could this measurement reward? So I was talking to a buddy of mine, and he runs one of those like really big socks, the kind with the big monitors around the room, and I'll let you know that the Pew Pew map is still alive and well. I haven't been in one in a while, but Pew Pew reigns on. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up Pew Pew map, it's beautiful. Anyway, we're talking about metrics, and he was talking about his team's uh, time to analyze metric. It was a really big pain point of this SOC. Overall analysis was taking way longer than they expected. So they brought the metric up to the team. Hey, time to analyze. Let's find ways to bring that time down. So you won't believe it. The team brought the time down. But guess what else went down? Quality. So guess what went up? True positives missed. So when you introduce a new metric, think about what potential, potential risky behavior could this new metric be rewarding? It might not be a bad metric, but you want to create other metrics that will balance it out. Because remember, you'll become what you measure. Then there's metric expiration. When is this metric not needed anymore? When our only lever was alert tuning, it might have made more sense for us to track alert volume. But now, as we move toward much more automation tools, maybe it's time we expire our alert count metrics or at least remove them from our leadership decks. And then data requirements. How much data will this metric require? How much new effort are we going to need to improve the metric? Because um, you can make as many, and this is why I argue, like, please just make one metric for each. It doesn't matter how many metrics you make. You don't get new people to, uh, you know, work on improving those metrics. You can create metrics to your blue in the face and be like, okay, great, but like, what am I focused on here? You want to avoid my mistake of trying to test across the entire attack framework, right? You might not need to. Think about what's, what am I actually trying to get to and then do the laziest thing possible. And anytime I talk about metrics, I always get asked, but how do I change the bad metrics I'm already presenting today? And I get it, change is hard. Leadership doesn't like surprises. And they often have expectations that you'll be updating last month's slide deck. But I have a tip that's worked really well for me. Um, here I've convinced my friend Dexter 
still my friend, to get in near freezing water. This is like four Celsius, 40 Fahrenheit. He's suffering right now. Um, my son is absolutely loving it too. He thinks this is the best. And when you jump in it, he's immediately like splashing you because you are just in pain. And when Dexter got in here, his first reaction was shock. His heart rate spiked. When he hit the water, he gasped. He had to try not to hyperventilate. But then suddenly, in about like a minute and 20 seconds, clarity. And it's the same when you change your metrics. It's not gonna be fun immediately. People will go into a state of shock, especially if they've been in those nice, cozy, warm metrics for a long time. They've gotten used to them. But my tip is to embrace it, push through the change, and they soon will have clarity around what you're actually delivering. So let's bring all the metrics together. And up front and center is our maturity model using the TDR maturity model. And we use the saver categories to tell the story of our program. And I don't get very long when I present this, so it's a short story. We're streamlining our efforts, our operations, to look at what's taking the most time. That's where we're focusing our automation. We looked at our threat intel and incident trends, and we're raising awareness about these top five threats to the company. And we're focusing our time this quarter to build detections for these threats. Here's where we're tracking. We've been exploring gaps in our security controls relevant to those top five threats. We found three new gaps. And from a readiness perspective, we have one type of reoccurring incident with a really long recovery time. So we're working with our enterprise security team to implement new controls that will prevent these incidents from occurring. So now, instead of making wild guesses about whether you're improving and if the tools you're buying are making a difference, you have a maturity model to measure your capabilities. Instead of using volume counts, fear tactics, and tired emojis, you can use Saver to get to the core of a metric, ask better questions, and map that to something you can control. Instead of focusing on 100% MITRE ATT&CK coverage, you're focused on what threats matter the most and are working on having detection coverage for those so you'll have real impact. So hopefully this talk is your wake up call, take a cold plunge, rethink your detection and response metrics. Thank you very much. This is my link tree. It has my contact info. It has a copy of this slide deck with additional slides for context. It has the complete TDR maturity model. I also write a very infrequent newsletter. I have a toddler, so you know, free time is abundant. Uh, it has an adorable cat that people love, and the security info is decent. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of the uh, cute stickers that my three-year-old helped me design with the cute cat. Um, so I've got time for maybe one or two questions. So yeah, let's do it. Resilience. Yeah, I think um, within your both like... Uh, Is that the goal that you're trying to reach? Yeah. Because you can all the the, yes, between like your ability to have like detection coverage across that vigilance across like the different threats you care about, having awareness to know like what type of the threats are, and then having that response to it, and having that readiness for being able to detect it. Yeah, absolutely. One more question. All right, I got stickers. Come get them. I'm gonna put them right here. Thanks so much, everyone.